Thank you for listening to this forum podcast. Please check out our website for a rich archive of podcasts and writing from contemporary philosophers and other researchers on a wide variety of topics. The Forum is an educational charity dedicated to bringing academic philosophy to a broader audience. Please consider donating to us via our Just Giving page, which you can find on our website. Happy listening. Thank you very much. Good evening. So cultural property is one of the many casualties of war and occupation. From the story of the Nazi commander who refused to carry out the order to destroy Paris at the end of the Second World War, to the tragic case of Khalid al-Assad, the celebrated Syrian archaeologist murdered by ISIS for his role in trying to protect the antiquities of Palmyra, the issue of protection of cultural property during armed conflict and occupation has long attracted attention. So this evening we'll be asking, what exactly is cultural property and whose property is it? What is its significance and how should we weigh its value against other priorities during times of conflict? What kind of risks should be taken to protect it and who is responsible for rebuilding, restoring and recovering when the conflict is over? I'm Sarah Fine from King's College London and fellow here at the Forum, and I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished panel tonight to discuss these issues. We have Helen Froh, who's Professor of Practical Philosophy and Wallenberg Academy Fellow at Stockholm University, where she's the director of the Stockholm Centre for the Ethics of War and Peace, and she's also a research associate at the Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law and Armed Conflict and at the Institute for Future Studies in Stockholm. And she's currently running a major AHLC research project on the status of cultural heritage in war. We have Issam Kubaj who's an internationally renowned artist and is lecturer in art at Christ's College, Cambridge. He studied in Damascus, St. Petersburg and London, and his art has been exhibited and collected across the world. We're going to hear more tonight about his recent work, which is related to the Syrian crisis and the destruction of his cultural heritage. Vernon Rapley is the Director of Cultural Heritage Protection and Security at the Victoria and Albert Museum and is the former head of Arts and Antiquities Unit at New Scotland Yard, and thus has been on the front line of efforts to combat the theft and trafficking of cultural artefacts and the fight to recover stolen pieces. A profile of him in the Journal of Art, published, of Art Crime, published in 2016, describes Vernon and his team as the most successful art detectives in history. <clears throat> Eleanor Robson, to follow that. (laughs) Eleanor Robson is Professor of Ancient Middle Eastern History at UCL. She co-runs the AHSC-funded Nahrain Network, which aims to develop the capacity of Middle Eastern universities, museums, archives, and cultural heritage sites to foster cultural and economic growth in the region. And she also edits the journal Iraq. Thank you very much. So I'm going to start by setting the scene and getting some context for the discussion. So the first question I have that I'm going to put to Helen is, what exactly is cultural property and whose property is it? Um, An easy one to start. An easy Um, one. uh, So, I mean, I think that is a difficult question, um, and I wonder whether we can do much better than a fairly sort of um, loose definition of cultural property. Um, And I think... When we talk about cultural property, what we tend to have in mind is something that, at least in part, derives its value from the way in which human beings interact with it. Um, So we tend to think of of sort of paradigm examples as being things of, say, religious significance or um, sites of historical significance. And that seems to reflect the fact that it's something to do with the way in which um, the, the value that people have conferred on a particular site in some way, that it has some kind of significance for them. Um, Having said that, I do think that it's probably not terribly important whether or not something counts as cultural property. Um, I think what we should remember is that lots of things can have value. They can manifest that value in different ways. They can be valuable for different reasons. So, for example, something with religious significance is not going to be valuable in the same way as something with historical significance. And 
I'm not sure how helpful it is to try and lump everything into one category and say, oh, well, that's cultural property. What we should really be interested in is how should we understand why these things are valuable, um, and given the sort of range of possible candidates for being cultural property, these things are going to be valuable in lots of different ways. And then we should think about how we should respond to that value. So really what we should care about is how should we treat these things? When may we damage these things? When should we reconstruct these things? Um, and I think focusing on those questions rather than sort of definitions of kind of what, what counts and what doesn't count is probably uh, a better way to make progress. Now, the question of uh, who owns cultural property, I mean, again, I think probably ownership is not a helpful notion here. Um, I think something like who's entitled to decide what happens to this stuff is perhaps a better way to think about the interesting question, which, again, is like how should we treat this stuff? Should we rebuild it? Should we protect it? Should we preserve it? Um, and so there's a question of who should get to, to, to answer those questions. And my sort of intuitive inclination is to think that um, our default assumption should be that the right to decide what happens to things should lie with the people who would be, say, most affected by the loss of some site or the damaging of some artifact, um, and perhaps who interact with it on a sort of um, fairly regular basis, where it forms part of their lives. If, if what makes cultural property valuable is the way in which we interact with it, how it's been part of our culture, then it should really be a question of um, thinking about the effect, who, 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 who its destruction would have the greatest effect on. Um, and obviously there'll be different answers to these questions. So something which is thought to be sort of significant for all of humankind, um, because it perhaps is reflective of our kind of, um, the way that human culture in general has evolved, so sort of early writings, that kind of thing. How we think who's entitled to deal with those sorts of artifacts is going to be different to say um, who's entitled to decide what happens to a particular re religious site that's sort of important for one religious group. So again, I don't think it's helpful to sort of try and have a one-size-fits-all answer to the question of who owns cultural property. It depends what the property is. Um, but I do think that our sort of default position should be to think that really um, whoever it's most significant for is who should have priority over thinking about um, what happens to it and that, the sort of, that we should be cautious about um, how much sort of what we might loosely call the international community feels entitled to dictate about how um, a site that's, say, of particular significance for a, a local group um, ought to be treated. Okay, thanks so much, Helen. So could we try now to get a sense of the nature and scale of the problem with respect to the damage and theft and loss and destruction of cultural property during armed conflict? Vernon, would you mind giving us some of the context here? Yeah, well, yes, because it's impossible to, to quantify, is the mm. honest truth. I think um, each, each conflict is different, each has its own characteristics, and each suffers loss in very, very different ways. But to put a scale on it is, is almost impossible. I think the important thing here is to not think just as a conflict as the point of military engagement, but to actually look uh, far broader at, at the period preceding military engagement and, and of course, uh, afterwards as well, which provide opportunities um, uh, for, for both destruction, loss um, and, and theft. Um, this is most evident in, in, in countries that are suffering some sort of turmoil before the, that leads to occupation or invasion or, or, or conflict uh, and the, break, uh, the breakdown of law there. Um, so to, to, to look at the scale of it as well is, is also to consider well, what, what are you actually looking at? Are we looking at the very obvious things depicted in the media uh, of destruction, of wanton deliberate destruction, um, or, or actually very often a more significant loss, in, the, in my opinion, through scale, comes from illegal excavation of objects taken from the ground that have not previously been recorded or lost. Mm -hmm. Very rarely publicised to the same degree. We see the sort of lunar landscape pictures appearing, but they're in a very selected press. And the, the focus always internationally and from the media is on, is on the high value, is from the museum thefts, the Baghdad Museum and the Kabul Museum, mm -hmm. uh, or it, it's on the objects that ISIS are smashing from Palmyra and, uh, and, and uh, um, uh, uh, in Assyria and places like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's incredibly difficult to, to quantify. And also, um, as is always the case, when a country is in conflict or at war, the, the reports are unreliable and it's very mm -hmm. difficult for internationally to get any true gauge on, on what is happening until, honestly, it's too late. Um, the, the times uh, when, when 
uh, ISIS are in control of an area, for, for example, um, we can't rely upon the reports. Uh, it's unusual, but now, of course, they're publicising the destruction as a means of their, of their campaign, which is quite new. That was not, uh, that was not done uh, in history. Um, uh, it's not something you shouted about, that you are deliberately destroying cultural heritage, but this is something that, that's changing. But even there, I don't think those reports are always reliable. We, we have clear evidence that before some of the destruction, actually, objects have been taken away and probably sold or put onto the illicit market for, for gain for, for that organisation before the destruction took, took place. Um, so I think all I can talk about with scale is maybe my own knowledge, uh, my own direct experience of following the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq um, when very few items of celebrated status were being recovered but there were tons of materials literally tons of material coming into London into New York and into Berlin and Switzerland um, the vast majority of which have been illegally excavated um, low to mid-range material um, not the most important objects but ripped from the ground and therefore in some ways more impactive possibly on the, the history and understanding um, of of that cultural heritage because objects in museums have been discovered, photographed, researched, studied. There are ways that they can be remembered or learnt from, whereas objects ripped from the ground during conflict, there's no record of where they came from, what context they were found in. There's no photographs of them. They can't be reconstructed. You can't do 3D technology to, to assist. So that, to me, is the real, the most impacted long-term damage uh, is, is this illegal uh, excavation uh, that, that's, t that's been taking place. Mm -hmm. but, and the other thing to look at when we're talking about impact is, you know, it, are we talking about quantity or financial value or, or impact on education, learning, or on the local community? And there, again, we see very different opinions um, as to the, to the loss. Uh, objects that archaeologists in this country and the Western world mourn the loss of, actually local people don't necessarily mourn in the same way. They mourn something that actually they were using um, and that they were still it was part of the living history of that monument or history. It was still part of the community. It was still a place of worship or, or, or a place for, for, for gathering or something along those lines. So the, the difference in the, in the impact and assessment is, 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 very, um, is very, very noticeable. So the short answer to your question is no. Uh, I can't, <laughs> I can't um, I, and I think anyone, nobody could, could accurately describe um, the, the, the scale mm. of, of the, the problem that we face. But it's <laughs> Thank you. Eleanor, would you like to come in on this yeah. same issue? Thank you very much. So, yeah, I think I'd be most helpful to follow up with a concrete case study. Yeah. So, as Sarah says, I, I, um, I work on and in Iraq. And so my whole career, since I, I um, started my graduate studies in uh, the summer of 1990, just to the point at which uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait and... So the whole of my career has not simply been as an ancient historian, but has been very much involved in thinking about my colleagues in Iraq and, and um, the things we work on in Iraq. So, yeah, case study, um, primarily, let's think about Mosul, which um, was, as you know, invaded by Daesh ISIS in the summer of 2014 and was liberated over the course of last winter through, through to the spring. Before, for a long time before that, it really had um, been very badly neglected by um, the central government. And so there was a, and that was one of the reasons for, for um, local people initially um, thinking that ISIS might not be a, a, as bad as the current situation. So then you're looking at a whole multiple levels of, of damage, destruction, loss and theft just in this one city over the course of the past three years. So there's the, the long-term neglect and abandonment because money is being and resources are being put into war effort. Or, um, there are deliberate targeting of, of, of buildings and of important places, which may be considered to be, of, as Vernon says, of international importance by outside experts or of deep, meaningful local ex, um, importance by people who, who live there. There's all the collateral damage that gets done because people are fighting house to house, street to street, and we saw that in particular over the, in the last few 
weeks of the war in Mosul where the most damage got done, partly from the aerial bombardment from the, the, from the, um, the coalition trying to drive out ISIS and partly because of the, 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 the fighting in the street and partly for ISIS setting, setting bombs in important places. Then there's the looting, both the subsistence looting of people who are so desperately poor in, uh, in times of conflict that they have no resource other than to, to dig and, and, and sell for, for money. And then there's also a lot of professional looting as well. Um, and then we didn't see it in, um, in Mosul this time, but certainly um, happened in the 1990 uh, Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. Uh, there's war booty too, and there was the whole-scale removal of the contents of the Kuwait Museum back up to Baghdad, and uh, uh, in which professional museum curators were basically forced to pack things up and, and deliver them. So it's a really complex mixture, and it is multi-layered, and it comes and goes. So, for instance, there was a huge shift in um, the intensity of aerial bombardment in Mosul um, when the American government changed over, the, over last winter and policy on um, aerial bombardment shifted. And then policy was to drive out ISIS at all costs, and, the th and that included human life and the, the, the physical infrastructure of the city, which is 5,000 years old, been continuously inhabited for 5,000 years. So there's just this sort of... T you can see there's two halves of the city. The city half of the city that was liberated um, before the change in, um, in military p uh, policy, which happened incredibly uh, quickly and very little uh, damage was done, and then the, uh, the, the western side after... Uh, in the spring and summer, which is just devastating. OK, thank you very much. That's really helpful. And now we're very fortunate to have Issam, who's going to give a, us a presentation of some of the images of his work in this context. Lovely. Great. But I am going actually to ask uh, the light to be slightly down, and maybe you, want us you to will shuffle be... along? I think that is very <laughs> helpful. If, I'm really um, sorry. I didn't expect oh, the no. geography of the no, room would okay. be... Uh, um, uh, yes. Is there any chance to... <laughs> I'll come around here. It's on the stage. It's on the stage. Okay, so would you like me to start singing while I'm waiting for... It? Okay. <laughs> um, it will be at least... Here it is. Um, There's a problem. Here, but... I will be speaking for a while about the work I am doing in reaction to what I have seen from distance, if you like, of what happened to my own culture. I am from Syria, and this is... Uh, what I, it's not very clear, so I have to wait, actually you have to cope with my singing now until uh, the light will be dimmed a little bit because it will be much clearer. Yes, just so working. more. Oh, oh. well like done. Disco, yeah. bit more. <laughs> oh. bit more probably. <laughs> this one? There we go. Ah. Okay. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Good. Much better. Great, thank you. This is much nicer light to the, to the eye at least. Okay. Um, I studied uh, fine art in Damascus, architecture in Russia, and uh, theater design in London. And for my theater design, I took the epic of Gilgamesh as my uh, part of my um, degree. So here it is, the epic of Gilgamesh for the Olivia Theater. And talking about Gilgamesh, I came back from Cuba and I decided to work with chairs. And here is another piece in Waterstones in Cambridge called Immigration Inspired by the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, some of my work at the British Museum relating to Iraq invasion and this particular piece called Sound Palimpsest, um, it was exhibited twice in Iraq's past speaks to its present and in modern Syrian art. And um, at that exhibition actually in um, modern Syrian art I was asked, I was given a talk and somebody asked me, are you doing anything about Syria? I said no. This is 2011 because it was just very fresh. Everything was far too fresh for me to look at it and to produce something decent. I didn't want to rush it. It was far too close. It's my home. So the first time, actually, I dared to propose something, it was in this exhibition in 2013 and called Excavating the Present. 
And I, t I managed to make this exhibition, the opening of the exhibition, on Syrian Mother's Day, 21st of March, 2013. And the whole idea of this piece, made out of X-ray images, that many mothers are collecting body parts to mourn them. This was my intention. And I called it excavating the present because it's to do with the technology of using, um, if you like, X-ray as a photogram. It means a, uh, an image without a camera. And the same thing, I have taken these X-ray images as big as my body as you see them and print them in wet photography in the dark room and the idea of excavating the X-ray itself. Um, my mother had only one month of schooling, but she really wanted to teach my children how to read and write. So this is her uh, attempt to uh, teach them the alphabet and the, letter, the, the, the numbers. I took this note, this is in 2014, even if you read Arabic, you could see how much she's struggling mm -hmm. with her Arabic. Mm -hmm. I took this idea of counting and alphabetizing and I made this piece, quite a very big piece in a gallery here in, in London called P21, and it's called Counting and Alphabetizing the Loss. This is to do with, with Syria, of course. And I imitated her, if you like, writing by, I am a right-handed, I used my left hand, and this is an upside down, and the piece called After Image. Um, in the same exhibition, I had this very big piece called Unearthed, about 18 meters uh, piece, relating to the morning ribbon. As you see it, it's actually all of these books to do with lost Syrians, that is, they did not, nobody mourned them. So I exhibited this piece a few times in different locations, in Cambridge Cattle's Yard, in the British Museum, in the ground of the British Museum. And talking about the British Museum, here is a very interesting plate. We have seen it today. Um, I was really inspired by the calligraphic uh, element of this plate, and this is how I responded to it. I took this uh, idea of X-ray, it's called the dark side of the unknown ray. But if you look at the clock in the middle, it stopped 2011, and this is exactly what happened. That is still the idea of the revolution that changed its title to uprisings, changed its title to conflict, to war. There is so many different things, but the, the clock is stopped for, from my perspective. Um, I made this exhibition a few um, years ago, in 2015, um, relating to refugees, and it's called Another Day Lost. And in my essay, I said life, lives are on hold and many are becoming citizens of a tent. I will run the next few slides very quickly just to tell you this is 12 edition of this piece in different parts of the world. And here they are. They are all relating to different sites of refugee camps around Syria. I tried to match them with uh, sites in London uh, simultaneously, by the way as part of one of the festival. The idea of this piece is a refugee camp and there is a matches around them and the amount of matches relates to the amount of days since the Syrian uprising, 15th of March 2011. Here they are, in Hampstead, in East London, in the Goethe Institute, in St. James's Piccadilly, and inside the refugee tent I created a camp in another location in a warship in London in um, Trinity Wall Street in New York, inside the tent, and in Philadelphia, in Dubai, the camp becomes a city. Mm -hmm. In New York again, and in Cambridge, and then finally in Budapest. And look what happened to the camp. Mm -hmm. It's spelled out of the tent. So this is one of my projects to do with another day lost and refugees, but Talking about looting, this is what happened. I asked my question, the future of my past. This is what I was trying to play with. I came across this very beautiful ships from the Fitzwilliam Museum, and I decided to, to make response to them. In, in 400 BC, my country used to this, sent to the sea goddesses. And look what happened in 20 something. Mm -hmm. Look what happened, refugees. So this is my piece 
called Dark Water Burning World, and this is in collaboration with the poet Ruth Bedell. And again, this piece was exhibited in different locations, but I will come back to this in a second. When Ruth came back from Lesbos, she said something really very powerful, that many of these people arriving to Lesbos, they were buried, but unknown. Um, nobody knew of them except their, um, if you like, whatever left of their clothing. So I took the idea of clothing, and I made this piece called Lost. Actually, I could hear many people talking about Lost today. And I exhibited in different museums. Here is the Classical Archaeology Museum in London, again against this beautified um, heritage of the Greek and the Roman. And then recently I have done another piece with the British Museum relating to Syrian wasters. So I took the idea of wasters and I created a piece called Siege relating to um, homes. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are currently actually in the British Museum um, in the Islamic uh, Gallery. Um, the last few things I'm going to show you. This is an exhibition currently at the Penn Museum called Cultures um, in the Crossfire. And I have seven pieces. Um, the first thing you see is a performance by me, Burning Matches, called Strike. Um, and it is when you see them after how many days, look, this is a nest or a city, but look at the, the feeling of, I mean, it's relating to barrel bombs, actually, this particular mm -hmm. piece. Um, this is a Kurdish doll, and this is how I responded to it, called Seed. I took one of my children's toys, and I put it in this mincing machine, and what's underneath is this olive seeds. I took this cylinder seal, and again, look at this beautiful animal's floating around, and I made a piece called Homeland and Excavation. And it's actually a passport office to do with, with stamps and uh, bureaucracy. And this is, again, Book of the Dead, Dismembered. And I will say a few words about this piece. Again, um, Dark Water Burning World. It's currently at the Penn Museum. And the VNA, it was visiting VNA for uh, the Refugee Week. And uh, in Aldebra, against the seaside. Mm -hmm. And currently at the British Museum with another piece called Lost. And an exhibition called Living with Gods. This is what I have done so far in response to what my heritage, what I understand of my heritage, looking at it from distance. This is what I have done. Thank you. Thank you. Light up again. Are you sure you want the light up again? Thanks, Sam. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go on in the second part to discuss the question of um, the risks that should be taken in defense of cultural property. But before we do that, I wondered whether anybody had any questions for the panel about what we've heard so far. Yes, is there a roving mic? Yeah, okay, the microphone's coming around to you. Thank you. Mark Dunkley, British Army. Has cultural heritage, cultural property been weaponised? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. D does anybody else want to ask a question before we answer that one? Yeah, just behind you. Do you want to just pass it back? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Julia, a student from King's College. And I'd like to know if ISIS tries to define uh, these antiquities as their own. <coughs> Does ISIS define these antiquities as their own? Yeah. Okay, great. So we've got the question, has cultural property been weaponized, and does ISIS define these as their own? So does anybody want to start us off? Um, Helen, yeah, thank uh, you. Um, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's certainly true that cultural property can be a tool of war. Um, and one of the things that a lot of people in heritage studies, for example, have been pointing out is that the destruction of cultural property can often be an indicator that you're going to have um, some kind of genocide. Um, so you sort of you start by burning the libraries, right? And, and that there's this sort of attempt to eradicate the culture of a people is a pretty good indication that violence against people is going to follow. So, um, and I don't think that's anything particularly new. I think in that sense, um, the, the sort of the, you've got that very kind of clear sort of sense that you're trying to. That's the first step down a violent path. But then also, you, if you look at things like ISIS. It, 
the, the sort of the destruction of, of, of property as a sort of a means of trying to eradicate identity, um, weaken morale, um, show your strength. Um, these are all ways in which um, the destruction of these um, important sites and artifacts can be a way of furthering your war effort. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I would say that cultural property has, has always been weaponized. I mean, the, the, some of the sites that we've been fretting about in northern Iraq um, were first destroyed in 612 BC by uh, Babylonians and Medes, that is, uh, uh, invaders from the southern Iraq and from the uh, Iranian mountains who'd had enough of being occupied by the northern Iraqi Syrians. Um, and, as, and a lot of the, the places that we've been worrying about were first destroyed as part of that invasion. Um, and so it wasn't simply about eradicating a political state, but er- eradicating all of the, um, the particularly um, acute represent- powerful representations of that state, and you see very targeted damage from antiquity as, as a result of those wars. Um, and as Vernon uh, also mentioned, um, this question of, 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 of ISIS and, um, and, and ownership of, of, of um, Syrian and Iraqi heritage, ISIS have not been their, their own most reliable reporters on what they've done. They've made, it's been very much about producing propaganda. Um, so there's been two levels. One has been the immediate destruction of, of places... Uh, and buildings and objects that matter very much to local people. And as, as Helen says, it's been about erasure of local identities. But a lot of the, the filmed footage has been targeted very much at, at Western academic audiences mm-hmm. and been very much designed to shock. And then when you get to see the sites, you see, as I have been myself as, as, um, in last April... The, the, the video damage is in fact incredibly localised and is designed to produce maximum effect rather than maximum damage. I mean, there is acute damage, but it's not as extensive as, as people assumed at the time. So this sense of, of feeling that, that the right to um, not only to, to destroy, resell, plunder, but also to, to um, perform that, I think that the idea of... of, of Ownership as performance, I think, is really important for, for, um, uh, for ISIS, particularly in Iraq. But I would also say that ISIS isn't a single entity, and the way it's interacted with heritage in northern Iraq has been very different to different parts of Syria, um, which I know less well, and maybe you might want to say. I actually want to touch on something, if I may, that's actually, it's not only the filming and the propaganda, but actually having using the internet as a tool of, in itself to send the message mm. to the wider community. Look what we are doing. We just The idea of hurting the national, international community, look what we could do. But particularly, so it's not only the destruction, but so the message of destruction, how it's sent, I found that is really very powerful, how the internet is being used in this particular way. I, I imagine that is if there is no internet, it's the impact, it's much, mm. how to send the message to the outside world is much more limited. But having the internet is used very, um, in an evil way. Mm. That is actually, look, we can do this one, and we know that if this hurts you, we will do it, and we will do it in a very, perform- I mean, the, <laughs> the performance is, is as important as mm. the message they are trying to play with. I I absolutely agree with that. I think, actually, the difference here is that that previous war crimes, attacks on cultural heritage, have been directed against the people that are involved Mm. in the conflict. And, actually, what ISIS are trying to do now is to hurt us and to hurt people outside of the conflict zone. And one of the most effective ways they can do that and to bring... Are, are us into the conflict effectively and to, to damage us is to destroy heritage in such a public way. So I think, I think this is a different methodology that's, that's been used. As I said before, it's, it's unusual for them to publicise these, these crimes, and, and they are you know, war crimes, but I think they're doing it because it's their way of directly impacting upon us. They're not targeting the local people. I don't think they're taking out Palmyra because they think it will hurt local people. It's certainly done for no military gain. It's to extend the war and the conflict to the people that they're truly trying to attack. 
Okay, well, thank you very much. We're going to move on to our second part and hear another difficult question, I'm afraid, which is how should we weigh the protection of cultural property against other priorities during times of conflict and what risks do we think should be taken to protect it and why? Can I start with you, Eleanor, on this one? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's hugely difficult. And again, I think we have uh, a lot of the... I mean, the legislative framework that we're that internationally working with is that the um, Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict, which was formulated in 1954, if I get my dates right. Mm. And that assumes that all, all parties to conflict are essentially state and that have some sort of legal framework and will operate within a legal framework. Increasingly, over, over past decades, we've seen that conflict involves non-state actors as much as, as state actors. And so that really challenges the premise of the, of the legal framework in which we can respond. Um, and often there's nobody in a particular conflict who has legal responsibility. Um, and then that's down to local professionals often who are making very personal judgments, immediate judgments, snap judgments a lot of the time, balancing their lives and their families' lives versus the, um, the, the, the fate of the, the, the places that they not only professionally are in charge of but often care for very, very deeply. So you mentioned Khaled al-Assad, for instance, mm. but we, mm. I'm sure Islam also knows there are many other... Um, Local. local people who are either professionals or, or just you know, passionate about it who, who do make those choices. Um, and it's very hard for um, us as outside who, are, who have no... Yeah, it's really very hard to, to say... I find it very hard to say to, about what people should or shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also find it quite difficult to thinking about what state parties who are not directly involved in the conflict should or should not be doing. Mm. Um, even, yeah, and so, yeah. So I've run out of things to say articulately, so I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, I just, actually, I, I don't see the question is, should we define this or this mm. at all? I see it is, it is the same thing. It is the bond between people and their heritage never being separated. Why the choice is between this or this. Um, heritage without people means nothing. Yeah. People without yeah. heritage means nothing. Mm. And I think that is the idea of any outside intervention should consider both as equally as important. I think that is there should not be choice. It should be... I have been in many different cultures in my life. I went to see the Mayan, and I just look at the landscape and the Mayan and the scape. And this is what, how, mm. how we extend ourselves to the landscape and the landscape to ourselves. I think that it should be, shouldn't be a separate item. They should be one item with two different faces. That's really fascinating. Thank you. Vernon? Um, I absolutely agree with that. Mm. Uh, I think it's... Um, it is exactly as you say, people without culture is like a tree without roots. It's, mm-hmm. it's, there's no point in, in military going in to protect a country unless they protect the country, not mm-hmm. just save the lives of people. And it makes the difference between living and mm-hmm. life. And um, so I think, I think that's really, uh, really important. I, I, I think just talking about to the sort of legislation and the, my uh, fear that legislation, you know, is, there's the Hague Convention 1954, mm. but actually there was the Hague Regulations on the Conflict of War mm. 1899 and 1907. Yeah. Napoleon okay. prescribed um, that, that, we shouldn't, that we shouldn't damage cultural heritage. Um, does that work? Uh, no. Uh, does, it, does it work? Um, has it worked in any conflict? And, and certainly would it work in the, in the current arena? I, 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 don't think, uh, I, don't, I don't think it does. I think what I wanted to, to just touch on briefly is maybe some false expectations that have grown. I think there's, when you hear public outcry about Palmyra, there were calls for, well, why don't we do something about mm-hmm. it? Why don't the military drop in and save Palmyra? And there was, a, there was you know, genuine calls for this. And there, there is somebody in the room who aren't embarrassed who knows an awful lot more about this than, uh, the, than I do. Um, but it's, not, it's simply not that easy. You can't, for example, engage in a field of war that you're not engaged in and you can't go into a country with a small force and protect particular cultural heritage items and then 
preserve that area. You need supplies and shipments and equipment and everything else to come in, which brings a full-scale invasion. And so I think there's been some expectations on cultural heritage protection that don't fit with, with, the, with the landscape, with, with war. Um, and if we look at successful examples, of course, it has to be things like the, the Monuments Men, where they were embedded within units going forward and able to protect heritage as best they could when they got there. Um, and, and again, you know, I applaud the, the efforts of the UK now to, to reform something along those lines. But again, understanding there's limitations. They'll only be used when we're engaged in that conflict. And I think what's missing at the moment is what do we do about those areas like Palmyra that, that we can't, that we, we don't physically have the um, capabilities to, to get in there and deal with. And are we letting down the people by, by failing to protect that from an, a, a, an enemy that we don't fully understand and we're not capable to deal with in, in, in the way that they're committing these crimes? Fascinating. I have a feeling that Helen might bring something different to this discussion <laughs> yeah, from an ethics yeah. of war position. So, so Helen, yeah, so, um, so I mean, I'm, I'm going to disagree. Um, <laughs> yeah, so something I've found as a, a, a really a relative newcomer to this debate, but from a sort of moral philosophy background, something I found quite surprising is the the way in which people do sort of treat, say these things like there's no people without heritage or. There's no point saving the lives if you don't save the heritage. And I think, gosh, I think there's a lot of point saving lives even if you don't mm. save the heritage. Mm. And I, I think one of the things I found kind of fascinating is this push to think that we can only value culture if we put it on a par with stuff mm. that we need to survive. We should treat it... I mean, I've seen a recent Getty report on, mm. on this uh, that literally equates cultural property with air and water in terms of what people mm. need for their survival. Now, that's just clearly false. Um, and so I think I understand the motivation to want to say, gosh, this stuff's really important. It makes people's lives go well. There's a big difference between making, enriching someone's life and them actually having a life. And I really, so I really do think it's important to remember that, especially given that we've got finite resources, we do have to choose between these things. Every time we give money to protect a cultural artifact, that's money that's not given to, say, curing disease, alleviating poverty, saving people's lives. And we shouldn't pretend we're not making that choice. We are. Um, and then if we say, well, I mean, Sarah, I think your question was, how should we prioritize these things? Well, it seems to me I would rank cultural property quite low compared to saving people's mm -hmm. lives. Um, I would think it's nearly always impermissible to impose anything more than a very small risk of serious harm on a person for the sake of protecting property. I think that goes for soldiers as well. Um, so I think we should remember, of course, the difference between imposing risks and taking on mm -hmm. risks. So I think it's fine for someone to yes. risk their own life to save mm -hmm. something they care about. That's very different to the question of how, as, say, an intervening armed force, you ought to distribute mm -hmm. risk. And I also think it seems to me impermissible to expect soldiers to increase the risks to themselves, to order a soldier to, say, um, undertake mm -hmm. a riskier offensive rather than a safer one for the sake of property. Mm -hmm. Um, it is stuff. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and, absolutely. And so I really, I, something that's been really mm -hmm. fascinating to me coming to this um, debate is the, the reluctance there is to kind of tackle these questions mm -hmm. head on and accept that we are making choices, mm -hmm. and they're very important yeah. choices, and we have finite resources, and we have to choose sometimes. And now, of course, there are instrumental explanations of why often we do need to protect heritage um, that... If a, a local armed form goes just tramples all over a religious site, right? People in, in the local community are not going to want to work with that armed force. It's going to make their lives difficult. Could make conditions much more dangerous for the soldiers as well. Um, it can thwart your sort of your your military goals in various ways. But I think setting aside those sort of instrumental justifications, if we're coming down to the fundamental question of how should we rank cultural property against people, then I think we should mm. always think that people win. Mm. May I chip in here? Because yeah. I, I actually you know, fundamentally agree with you, in fact. And the reason I was talking about, you know, about local people ma making choices for, for themselves, and I think also that we, that we can distinguish, I think, quite helpfully between um, sort of visitor attractions, to put it very crudely, and, and places where people live. Mm. So, um, so, for instance, I think this... And this question of who we is, we talk about we should decide. And really, I, I feel very, very strongly whenever I'm asked um, by media what I think the priorities are for, for reconstruction or anything, I say it's not my business to choose. I just really, it's not my, it's not my cultural property. 
Um, so, and then related, related to that, I've just lost the, my thread. What was, what was my original point? Um, so, um, yes, coming back to, um, to, to risk, that's right. Um, the point I wanted to make was, yes, a lot of the archaeological sites that have been so um, sort of focused on the media are really incredibly artificial constructions that... Palmyra, for instance, is the outcome of a whole process of rebuilding since 1925. Nimrud, south of Mosul, is a process of rebuilding since 1955. They are not the pristine ancient sites. They have been cleared of their local inhabitants by Western academics in order to construct a fantasy past, which we then become incredibly precious about. (laughs) And so... You know, this stuff has all been destroyed for millennia already. And, you know, we, we are now just witnessing the next phase of its, of its destruction history. And I think pretending that that hasn't happened and trying to erase that part of its, of its long, long history is um, a waste of money. And, yeah, kind of kidding ourselves that we're, we're doing something meaningful. Mm-hmm. If someone wants to come in here. I, would just yeah. like, I totally yeah. agree in the way you put it, but there is another side of the story. You said it, it is stuff, but what happened actually when culture is not stuff? Mm. When culture is rituals, when mm. culture is intangible. Mm. I know, for example, many refugees are really distorted their psyche, that is, they are out of their own culture, they don't want to be anywhere else to be lovely. Thank you. Um, that the idea that actually they are out of of uh, somewhere where they could listen to their own music, they could listen to um, other people speaking their language. So when it becomes when it becomes not stuff, that is where I believe that is actually the the distinction is not anymore should be a distinction between two separate items: is the people or their, if you like, tangible and intangible cultures. I mean, I, I agree that we, we can distinguish between... I mean, I tend to think... When I think about cultural property, I tend to think more about stuff and then stuff. cultural heritage, exactly. the sort of the broader category, mm-hmm. to include sort of rituals, language, and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess the thought is something like... It's... Uh, when you're depriving people of things like um, the capacity to speak their language or to engage in freedom of religion or expression or so on, you're interfering much more directly with people. Mm. I find it much easier to understand why we should prevent that, right? So Mm. I think it's it's easier to explain why those sorts of harms matter in a way that I think we can't just sort of think that then extends to the protection of buildings and sites and so on. So I think there is an important distinction to, to be drawn there, but, but I think the explanation of why then we think, okay, well, so now we might start using force, now we might start mm. probably sort of prioritising this stuff more, funneling money towards it, that's because the kind of activities that, that threaten something like my ability to express my religion and so on tend to be things that are, say, restricting my liberty in other ways mm-hmm. and so on. So, of course, they matter a lot, yeah. I think I just wanted to come back in on the um, the question really uh, about whether it's prioritising or whether it's equally shared. And I think that depends whether you're looking at it on a very operational level or actually on a strategic level. And I think for me, I was maybe looking more strategically about when a when an occupation is planned, what the military should be looking at, what areas they should recover. Whereas if you go down onto a granular level and you're talking about individual people, of course the preservation of that person's life is is, is paramount. And you serve, save their life first and then you worry about what, the, everything else they need to survive, including culture at a later stage. But if you're looking at it strategically, I think there's this in, need to incorporate it at that base level. The, the, why are you taking area? What, if there's a choice between moving into one town or another, w- would you maybe prioritise a town that had great cultural heritage? And I think that's been done throughout throughout history and military planning. Um, so, yeah. well, I'm going to open it to the floor now. So, do we have any questions? One at the front here. Let's start off. We'll wait for the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Helen and many of you have talked about the, um, <clears throat> the trade-off between physical objects and the people who might defend the objects or other people. I wonder if you could help me with a moral question I put to myself as an undergraduate 50 years ago <laughs> that I still can't answer. At that time, King's College, Cambridge, was my favourite building in the world. So, this is the hypothetical question. 
I see a man planting explosives around King's College, Cambridge. I know for certain that nobody will be hurt if he blows it up, and the only way I can stop that being destroyed is by killing him. Do I kill him? <laughs> no. Are there, are there other questions, and then we'll, go, we'll, we'll answer this one? Yes, over here. Thank you. Um, I don't know if it works. <laughs> anyway, um, do you think, as a philosophy professor, that cultural heritage is part of, I mean, is key to rebuild a Syrian identity once the war is over? Thank you very much. And I think we'll just take one more at the front here. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, there are situations where we should... Uh, endorse the removal or destruction of cultural property. Uh, And I'm thinking of situations like the removal of statues in in the U.S. supporting uh, kind of pro-slavery figures uh, or Ai Weiwei's destruction of the Han vase that was 2,000 years old. Okay, thank you very much. So we've got the question about should you kill the man to save King's College, Cambridge? Um, when, um, if ever, is the destruction of cultural property legitimate and is um, cultural property key to rebuilding Syrian identity? Who wants to start us off? I was very interested by, by your question, and, and I'll throw something very similar back uh, that, that happened, of course, in the Baghdad Museum that was fortified to a degree by um, Iraqi forces. And when the Americans turned up in their Abraham's tank, there was a sniper firing an old 303 rifle or something out of a, out of a, a hole at, at the tanks. And the decision that that tank driver had to take then was, um, do I drive on past this museum, not knowing what he's doing inside because he can't hurt me, um, or do I do something about it? Um, uh, uh, less risk, of course, than your scenario, because he was sitting there in a 60-ton tank um, and he chose to fire a 120-millimeter shell at the sniper uh, in the museum, therefore risking the destruction of the building to take out um, one defender. Uh, as uh, we, I think uh, you probably know this, but it was very lucky the shell didn't explode, uh, scared the life out of the person in there who ran away, and the museum was captured with, a loss of, with no loss of life. So it, it, uh, it turned out well. Um, but again, this is where I don't feel these choices sometimes between culture and human life are, are as clear-cut. They're, you know, they're decisions that are taken either a strategic or an operational level that are very difficult to, to, to make and sometimes in the heat of mm. conflict, not necessarily the, the wisest decisions um, or choices. Um, so I think that, to answer your question about the scenario, I take it you mean the chapel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the college is really no great shape. But, um, <laughs> um, but the chapel's very nice. Um, none, I think this is a question I've been given quite, quite a lot of thought to. A lot of my work has been on um, the question of what makes people liable to, to harm, um, and um, particularly in, in war. Um, it seems to me that probably it's not permissible to kill someone um, who's destroying objects, um, even if they're really, really nice objects. Um, I think that we should be careful to distinguish between the scenario you're asking about where we're asking it's just the value of the cultural property. You stipulated there's no risk to human life. It's just the value of the cultural property. Could I kill someone who is going to destroy it? And the, the sort of scenario that, that Vernon's painting where you've got this question of sort of, um, this is sort of the sniper in the minaret tower, can I cause collateral harm in order to um, take out a military threat but you know, I'm causing collateral damage to a, to a historic building? Um, there the question is not sort of a question of whether I'm justified in killing this person or assuming what justifies killing that, killing the person is that he poses a threat and I need to, 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 to kill him. Um, and I think in those cases it could be permissible to destroy cultural property as a side effect of trying to um, avert some threat to human life. But in the case where you're just killing just to protect the stuff, I mean, I share the intuition that a lot of people have. Um, I think you can, that, that it would be permissible... Um, I think you can have something like a law and order justification for using lethal force in defense of stuff, but I don't think that reflects some special value of cultural property. I mean, if you were sort of walking down the street with a baseball bat smashing up every car and the only way we could stop you eventually was to kill you, 
I mean, we probably would at some point kill you if that's all, because we're not going to let you just smash up everybody. But it's not because we think cars have got great cultural value that we need to defend. It's just we just have kind of general law and order reasons we don't let people just going around smashing stuff up or blowing up buildings. So I don't, so I don't think the fact that we have this kind of intuition that at some point it would be permissible shows that there's some value about the property that is special. Um, so no, don't kill him. Absolutely. <laughs> I actually would like to touch on the idea you said it will not hurt anybody. I, I think it will hurt quite a lot of people, not necessarily physically, but psychologically, to see such a very beautiful building to be demolished or somebody, I, I, will, I will be hurt to see such a magnificent piece of architecture and engineering that is, I will not dare to think of killing, but I, I just wanted to touch on this idea of hurt. Mm. And I think that it is back to this idea, what it hurt. It is, it is the feeling of, of course, I mean, it's just interesting that um, I know when the Taliban bombarded this very beautiful statue, it's as if not, if it's not there, it will disappear. But it's actually, its absence is as powerful as its presence. Of course, its presence is much stronger, but I don't dare to think that the absence of King's Chapel will be, or the absence of it will be as powerful as its presence. Mm-hmm. I think it is, it's the idea that is, it will hurt quite a lot of people that to see such a, such a very beautiful, elegant piece not being there. I just want to ask you the question back. Did you find the answer how many years later? Or you are still questioning this? I'm still questioning this. Can I just come back to something Helen said briefly? So, Helen, do you think it's not permissible, for example, to require a military unit to take certain extra risks, for example, to take a riskier route towards a target in order to make extra effort to protect cultural property? I think perhaps anything more than a very small risk, it would be impermissible to ask somebody to jeopardise their life for the sake of protecting cultural property. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, generally, if, if all that's at stake is value. I mean, I think um, once we factor in these kind of instrumental, you know, how, how people would feel, how it would affect the war effort if this building was destroyed and, or, or so on, we can sort of think about those um, those problems as well, but I think just purely if we're just sort of thinking just about the value of the cultural property, I think um, it wouldn't be permissible to ask the soldiers to um, accept an increased risk to their own life. Okay, so we'll go on to the third part now, and here we're going to think about the question of who's responsible for protecting cultural property and for restoring and rebuilding it post-conflict. And I guess we can also think about the question of whether it even makes sense to think about rebuilding or restoring things that have been lost and destroyed. So, Vernon, can I start with you in this segment? Okay. (laughs) Um, Well, I I think um, when it comes to responsibility, it's a a shared responsibility, and it's a multidisciplinary responsibility that's that's really important to to any rebuilding uh, or or post-conflict recovery. Um, And it's an area that we've been working on very closely uh, at the V&A with with Yale University, um, looking at uh, working with with people who have experience in post-conflict reconstruction in other fields to see whether or not that can create sort of roadmaps in the future to, to assist in, in cultural heritage recovery. And um, I was going to t- touch quickly on um, a project we've been running in Rwanda, looking at how they recovered from, from the genocide um, and how they've rebuilt their country around um, wildlife conservation, the preservation of the gorillas and their biodiversity, um, which has rebuilt or allowed for the complete reconstruction of the country. And it's been really interesting to see how they engaged the community in, in that project, how they brought everyone on board, um, which is something which I feel has been done very, very well in a number of places in wildlife conservation that has never really been ingrained into cultural heritage conservation or preservation um, from the very uh, sort of teaching of children at school the acceptance of a certain amount of loss I thought that was an incredibly insightful thing that they they did they they accepted that people who've been poaching gorillas for years would would carry on doing it um, and they didn't even fully condemn that 
because they to tell the children that their grandparents were evil mm, for mm, mm, for wiping mm. out their for their heritage um, was wrong, and so they accepted this 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 loss and started to feed into the community to to help with that with that rebuilding. So I think my first point is that, that we can learn from other sectors, we can learn from other um, people uh, about how we can do this. To, to look then at um, Who's responsible as well? I think this is going back to who owns or who uses heritage. Um, I'm very interested in the idea that, that an object doesn't have a single point of life and, and has already been mentioned many times, you know, why should we restore this monument to this point in history? Um, and, and the idea that, that monuments live, and but they still have life. And to me, one of the most important things is whether that monument is still used. And here I can maybe use an example from the Philippines, where churches were destroyed by, um, by weather, by natural disaster. And there was a great call to rebuild the churches in exactly the same way that they had been before, using the same techniques and same methods. But the local people didn't want that. Mm -hmm. They wanted their church back, but they wanted a meeting on a Sunday, and so they didn't want something that was going to collapse on their heads. And they actually wanted it to be rebuilt fairly authentically, but with improvements and changes, because it was part of this evolving life of, of the, the monument and the correct thing to do. And I think there we've been, that took us into uh, looking at um, how technology can help with this capturing monuments throughout history. And um, I was quite taken by Google's timeline, mm -hmm. where you can zoom in on something and then see all the aerial images of it throughout history. And actually thinking that that's probably the way that we should look at objects, that, that, or monuments, or buildings, not as, well, this is it, this is how we decided to preserve it in 1974 or 2017, but actually, you know, it started as this and evolved into this and, and developed. And so you're, you're celebrating and capturing the, the whole of its history. Mm -hmm. um, and this led us into the inevitable, which was something we call the REACH project, which we worked with the Perry Foundation and six other museums around um, the world, looking at the value of 3D copies of scanning objects, scanning monuments, scanning buildings, um, to create the possibility of these timelines so that you're starting to build objects up um, as part of the reconstruction. And this is, obviously we carefully examined the, the idea of, well, can you replace an object with a, with a copy or mm. repair it? And, and everything, every circumstance is, is different. I personally, I'm not a great believer that we should go back to Palmyra and rebuild it as it was two years ago mm. using 3D copies. <coughs> um, no. Should we leave it as it is? or should we? I don't know. But, um, and, and I think that's, you know, each site has to be considered in, in, a, in a different way to, to, to look at it. So overall what I'm saying is that I think there's a great re uh, reliance in rebuilding on capturing the local feeling, what's needed mm. from that building, what's needed from that site, and to a degree what's needed internationally, and then coming up with a, with a plan that, that fits for, the, for that area but makes it most importantly sustainable mm. so that we're not just pushing the sea back. We're not just rebuilding objects for them to be knocked down again four or five years later, mm -hmm. but we're rebuilding the community with those objects to preserve them, protect them, and cherish them mm -hmm. uh, in, in the future. Thank you. Esan. Um, I wonder, actually, if Google have seen my piece. I'm just looking at that one. If I may just show off a little bit. I am just going to show you a piece I have done myself. Um, I don't know if Google, uh, I should uh, sue them because they stole my idea. <laughs> yeah. um, it's actually a piece, it's called Cambridge Palimpsest. Mm -hmm. And it is a piece, literally, exactly what mm -hmm. Vernon was talking about. I have done this as part of the celebration of 800 um, years on Cambridge. And this is what exactly I have done. It is a jigsaw puzzle and you actually literally dig the history of the city back from now to 1940. So if I take it to pieces, I would just show it to you, and you may, might like to come here and play with it afterwards. Um, and here it is. It is to 1800 and to lost and hidden Cambridge. 
and the idea of these layers until the geology of the city. And it's called Cambridge Palimpsest. And I just wanted to touch on this idea that any object or any city or any site, mm. it's part of life is this idea of change. And mm. we need to accept this change. To reconstruct, I found that is actually... Um, Probably we are very privileged to have this digital media to enjoy this reconstruction, to enjoy between. Mm -hmm. But it's not nothing at all like the original. Nothing, of course, as an artist, I have to always uh, promote the idea of original. Having said that, mm -hmm. we don't have the privilege of time to understand actually what we are doing with mm -hmm. the digital media. We have many, many casts of many beautiful statues, and we accept them, the cast galleries in different around the world. We accept them now because we have the privilege of time to look at them from distance. To reconstruct digitally, I found that it's still problematic for me. Although I, am, I used it for my piece for the Fitzwilliam Museum, I made actually a digital copy. I am traveling with it all around the world showing my boats against it. But I found that is it's something, actually, some, somebody said earlier, I don't remember how, that's actually the interaction with the object. Mm. The interaction with the object, what makes the object its richness, its rituals, mm. its smell, its dimension, its the, f the, the, the object itself. Of course, um, when I have seen Palmyra constructed in, in, in London, I felt a little bit... This is nothing to do with heritage. It's a uh, scientific exercise, nothing to do with heritage, nothing to do with destruction. And also, yeah. that particular example just didn't, didn't help any of the people living in and around Palmyra mm -hmm. either. It was purely for, for Western audiences. Um, and my, my worry with technological solutions is that, that they exclude, um, that they're, they're highly uh, hierarchical and elitist, um, and assume all sorts of access to technologies that lots of people in most parts of the world don't have. Yeah. Um, and also, I want to come back to the question of, of, of heritage and reconstruction that the, that the lady asked about Syria. And it's actually, I mean, I'm, I'm off to, to Mosul next month to um, meetings with the university there to be thinking about precisely these questions because everywhere, all the damage in Mosul is multi-layered, and a city that's been inhabited for 5,000 years, there are real questions about prioritising people's standards of living. So in the, the old medieval city, for instance, which is, has 20 mosques in it, but also housed hundreds of thousands of people, um, they were essentially living in slum conditions because it was a medieval city. Mm -hmm. So there's the opportunity to provide people who desperately want to return to a place they really love with a decent standard of living... Do you just knock it all down and build flats? Um, do you do some sort of reconstruction so that it appears like it's a medieval city but it's still got all the modern infrastructure and facilities in it? Do you rebuild it exactly the way it is? Um, and everybody in the city has different opinions about that. Of course they do. And some of them, people have commercial interests in there and they want their shops back. Mm -hmm. They're international um, commercial interests such as the super, uh, French supermarket company Carrefour who want to come in and build a hypermarché in Mosul um, the mosque authorities the um, academic cultural heritage experts for whom that's their livelihood and their personal investment and their research so all of these competing interests and what we're going to try and do I hope is set up some, just some basic focus groups with people with different um, interest groups, different stakeholders to understand that the competing interests because you know there is no one cultural heritage in that city mm -hmm. um, and while the big international funders are coming in saying we want to help we want to help trying to get the balance right between actually giving a sustainable solution as Vernon says and actually acknowledging the fact that there are still hundreds of thousands of people living in tents in refugee camps out, mm -hmm. outside the city who are desperate to go home mm -hmm. So all of these things just make it massively complicated. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy for us to sit on this stage in London and say, this is what should happen. Mm -hmm. But really, yeah, mm -hmm. it's really, really difficult. Thank you. Last word to Helen. Oh, gosh. Um, 
I mean, I think, uh, so the question, um, who's responsible for protecting, I think it's, it's kind of maybe covering different things, because there's a question of, say, uh, who, who, who ought to pay for it? And then there's mm. sort of naturally, you might think, well, you know, whoever blew it up in the first place, you know, being sort of yeah. an obvious candidate. Uh, there's a question of who ought to bear the costs, um, mm. and the natural candidate's going to be who, who, whoever did the damage. Um, and there's the question of, um, and then, of course, you have the question of, well, if they can't or won't pay, then how do we distribute those costs? Um, and then you have the question of who's entitled again to the side, which doesn't seem like a question so much of responsibility, mm. which sort of suggests something like an obligation to protect. Mm. What people seem to fight over is who's, who's entitled to protect, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, Not who's yeah, responsible yeah, yeah. for protecting. Um, I think actually in a way, and I guess going back to some things I've already said, this might be unsurprising, um, for me, the difficult question is when is it permissible for us to fund money towards protecting or rebuilding and reconstruction um, of artifacts? And I think it depends on what it is. So I think that if you're talking about something like Mosul, where you're sort of rebuilding infrastructure, people really do need to sort of function mm. so on. That's very different to say rebuilding mm. ruins uh, that are absolutely. kind of you know outside yeah, of a yeah. town and are not really part of people's sort of, don't don't enable people to go mm. about their everyday lives and rebuild their lives. So I think again there isn't really a sort of a general answer to that question of who's responsible. We can't just say, well, in some cases, it's the international community, and in some cases, it's local people. Uh, it depends what it is that's been destroyed. It depends who destroyed it, um, and what we and sort of what rebuilding it will achieve for local people. Um, so I think the sort of responsibility again is not the, not the right way to think about this. It's a question of when are we permitted to what are, what are we permitted to spend our money on, and then who's entitled to decide how it's done? And I think I agree with a lot of what Ellen said about those sort of questions um, are just going to vary across the cases, mm. but it's very much thinking, I mean, crisis, I mean, Maybe, maybe a, a French supermarket is a good idea. Well, I don't exactly. know. Well, I, mean, you know, I don't you know. know. Who are we to say? <laughs> yeah. to say yeah. you know, people aren't entitled to, to go for a yeah. weekly supermarket shop. I mean, you know, the clerk is really very way. much better. Yes, but, but, you yeah. know, <laughs> uh, if, if a car falls, all you yeah. can get. I mean, yeah. um, so. If I may just say something, actually, one, one more thing. I'm not going to dare to ask you to move, but I'm just going to say, actually, um, currently, I am preparing for a show at Kettle's Yard, Cambridge, and the title of the exhibition might be of interest here. If I just, next one, it's called, um, the title of the exhibition called Actions, the image of the world can be different. And it's interesting, actually, the, the director of the gallery is inviting 38 artists to respond to this title. And particularly, I think that is really the whole idea of art being responsible of making the image of the world different. I found that is really a very powerful place. It's not an easy place to be in. But I just would like to end with something from my perspective. Um, the last piece I have done in the Penn Museum, it's called Aleppo Soap, mm -hmm. Don't Wash Your Hand. This is the last piece, actually, you see in the exhibition. And this is what I wanted to say. Actually, Aleppo is very famous of many different things, but one of the things that Aleppo is famous of mm. is soap. And it's stuck because it says, I did not wash my hands, actually, because of this. It's a very beautiful object. And this is what happened to many, actually, from my perspective. Many communities are, many governments are washing hands of what's happening, in, mm. particularly in Syria and particularly in Aleppo. So this is what I wanted to say. It is a shared responsibility. Archaeologists, scientists, mm. are, uh, all disciplines should contribute to reconstruction. Mm. This is what I want to say. That's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. It seems like there might be a tension here between the way things are presented because mm. the whole idea of protecting cultural property and cultural heritage is often presented as it's important not just for the people whose heritage it is, but for the whole world. And we have, our, we have world heritage sites and so on. But then the tone of the discussion has been, well, it's for the people who are directly affected to make the decisions about how to protect <laughs> it and how to restore it. Uh, so there is this mm. difficulty, isn't there, like, that, that we're all asked to care, but people should stay out of the question of what to do about it afterwards. Interesting. I wonder if anyone wanted to contribute there. I'm sitting next to you, Helen, so I'm just going to yeah, take on I mean, you. It is, it is, I, um, and that, again, it's been something that's been interesting to see how there's sort of this worry that um, um, there's a kind of um, the West sort of coming out and saying, oh, well, you ought to do these sorts of things, mm -hmm. and um, that's you know, objectionable in, in various ways. Um, 
again, it's sort of... It's weird to think that that's what it would take to motivate us to care. Mm -hmm. um, that, and I thought uh, this is interesting with what Werner was saying about how ISIS sort of promote their destruction because that's what, how they can get us to care about the conflict, right? Like, we're not going to care that all these people have died, mm -hmm. but look, you've blown mm -hmm. up a building. Mm -hmm. You're going to, and it's almost, and if that's right, that's really depressing that they know that's what will hook us. Is that that's what will be all over the newspapers is, mm -hmm. oh, this temple's gone. Gosh, that's mm -hmm. a tragedy, right? And then they've got all these boatloads of refugees and we're like, gosh, well, that's just very inconvenient. So, I mean, I think um, it, it would be depressing if, if we had to believe that somehow it was our heritage before we could care about the fact mm. that it was being destroyed, right? Mm. We should care about the effect it has on these people's lives for its own sake, irrespective mm. of whether or not mm. it makes... My life isn't going worse mm. because this temple was destroyed, but I can see that yeah. for somebody, it's somebody yeah. Yeah. their life really is going to go worse for that, and that's something I should care about. Yeah. Absolutely. But what about, I mean, you can see the philosopher here. <laughs> what, what, what if, for example, you know, if, if Italians were just to decide, you know what... We've just got all these ancient buildings and we'd really like to have more space for Romans to live. So maybe the Parthenon's got to go. You know, would it not be okay for people to step in and say, please, no, stop, that's got to stay. You, so you, can, is it, you can say, yeah. please, no, stop, yeah. but, right? What you can't do is go in and, pre you know, prevent them, right? You can try to persuade them, you can suggest creative mm. housing solutions, but I do think that we have to bite this bullet, but ultimately, if, you know, if somebody, if somebody might decide that they would rather a site naturally decay, and they don't want to interfere with it, they might say, no, look, it's just natural, over time, stones wear away, buildings down, you know, and that's just how things, and the idea that we would sort of go into somebody else's country and say, no, stop this, and sort of, I don't know what, use force? I mean, I, I you know, I... It's hard to see how, even though we think these things are beautiful and valuable, the world's got lots of beautiful and valuable things in it, and we build new stuff all the time. Um, so I, I don't think, actually, I, I, again, I, I feel the intuition that, you know, I like lots of Italian stuff, but um, I do think, ultimately, if they decide, look, we just can't house people because we've got all this old stuff everywhere, then, you know. Okay, well, I can see that people are itching to ask questions. Uh, there's one at the front here and one at the back there. We'll start with you. Thank you. Uh, persuasion is good business. I remember 2003, a Chatham house, a handful of people were trying to stop the war, the invasion of Iraq against the coalition forces, but it was only a handful of people, and the persuasion didn't uh, work out, and uh, Iraq has been invaded. Now, there is a continuation of war in these zones. Therefore, we cannot see who looted a lot or who ruined these countries or whatever, all of those places. So then, therefore, when we make actually a real account, we do need to see the departure of these incidents. And secondly, reconstruction of a country, I think, in the UN is impossible for occupational forces. I think there are certain barriers about it, so I would like to find out the legal framework about it, if the invasionary forces have got right to take place in the reconstruction work. And the third question, if the military decides to invade a country, let's say Badat, because I don't see the art, artifact issue is only individual art craft. It can be a city, it, it can be an antiquity, like Baghdad or Mosul, whatever. But if B-52 airplanes decide to shoot them or hit them, is there any kind of preservation mechanism uh, they would lead them not to do so? By persuasion, by lobbying, by PR, for example, you know, uh, leave out the city and then, you know, we won't bomb you, uh, but we will still, you know, keep you surrounded, uh, you know, in the near future. I mean, is there such a mechanism? Thank you very much. And just one sec, we'll wait, wait for the mic. Thank you. That's okay. I just wanted to draw uh, the panel's attention to some previous questions from the previous round that weren't answered. There was some in particular that I was interested in, so mm -hmm. I wanted to hear the panel's thoughts on, you know, destruction of property and, and, and how does that, is there a call for that in, in terms of uh, preserving culture or moving forward? And so the questions that were raised in the previous round, and there was one other question in the back that was raised as well. I was interested in hearing an answer to, so... Thank you. And one more question here at the front. <clears throat> it's okay, it's coming. Oh, I'm going to have to. Um, so you all kind of spoke about the evolving lives of sites, and I'm actually interested in 
conflict, I mean the conflict that they were destroyed or um, vandalized, you can say, in, that's part of the site's life. So in the reconstruction, should we address that in how it's reconstructed? And if so, how can we address that? Because it is a traumatic event for a lot of people, so it's kind of the difficulty of finding out, yes, we should address that part of the site's life, but we don't want that necessarily to negatively affect how people interact with that site. So I was hoping someone could maybe give some insights on that. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to come back to the panel now um, to answer those questions as best you can or to pick which ones you'd like to answer and to give us your final thoughts for the night. So, Vernon, I'll start with you. <laughs> I'm going to try and answer two or three questions, uh, actually. Um, one, is, one is about the need for local people to be involved in the decision-making. Mm-hmm. Well, my argument is, well, they've been doing it for 2,000 years, so mm-hmm. they should do it for the next 10 or 12 as well. <laughs> um, and I think, coming back to your question, sir, which I thought was very interesting about, do we have, should statues be taken off display? Should they be removed? And I think you were talking um, about America. And I also... That reminded me of the uh, pamphlet, the leaflet or the, for, for this, or where there's the statue of Saddam Hussein being pulled down, which was celebrated. Um, and and I, I found that quite interesting, that that's the destruction of cultural heritage that we're applauding and celebrating. Uh, in America, it's different because they're taking them off display and having worked with American museums, I can tell you that that just creates another problem because the idea of the local authorities is that we, we don't want them on display anymore, stick them in a museum. Um, and the museum probably don't want uh, hundreds of statues that they've now got to preserve and look after. But, it, but it's fashion and it's decisions being made by local people that, that are really important. And then to come back to your question about damage and whether it can be celebrated or kept. I was going to use my own building. The Victorian Albert Museum was bombed four times in the Second World War. It's one of the few sites in London that preserves with pride the bomb damage on our facade on the Exhibition Road. Um, It's a great example of of bomb damage in London. There's not not many left. You can see the entire uh, damage. It obviously was hugely damaging, but not structurally for, for the museum. We've even celebrated that when we've then gone further and recreated the new facade. Um, we've taken away part of the old built building with, that was damaged by bombs, and we've actually captured the uh, impression that that bomb damage made on the new gates that we've used to replace it and replaced it with a plaque. So I, I think absolutely the view of my organisation is that that's part of our history. It shouldn't be erased, whatever. We will, we will memorialise it and, and actually use it as part of our att- attraction. Um, anyway. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Um, so, uh, gosh, I don't know. So, I think the, the question about whether... Um, where have you gone? Destruction... Uh, uh, whether um, destruction should be part of um, sort of the reconstruction and, and the sort of the signs of conflict and so on. I think... There's a really interesting example of that in, in Beirut, uh, where the, as you sort of walk around, you can still see the bullet holes um, on the buildings um, from the Civil War that haven't been, they haven't tried to, to cover up or, or repair. And I guess that's one way in which you can, you know, you can rebuild, but you, you leave these markers so that people remember. Um, and I think that's important. I mean, this is now part of the heritage. It's part of your history. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think this is another reason why it's objectionable if we try and sort of recreate something sort of pristine or just like it was before when you've got a local population who will have had relatives killed and had their lives is turned upside down. The idea that we sort of say, well, we're just going to pretend like that didn't happen. Yeah. All right, it seems really, really objectionable. So I think we should absolutely, if we do reconstruct, do so in a way that, again, is sensitive to sort of how local people feel about reflecting, reflecting the conflict. Uh, and then just quickly on, on the removal of, um, um, of statues and things. Um, so I'm writing a paper about this at the moment, so it's something I'm quite interested in. Uh, I, I do think that there can be a case for removing what would be thought of as cultural artefacts um, when you've got people who are participants in very serious uh, moral wrongdoing, um, 
I don't buy this idea that somehow, look, it's all part of the historical record. I mean, if you look at what the sort of people who are depicted, I mean, you go to Trafalgar Square, it's just all sort of white guys, right? I mean, we're already incredibly selective about what we depict, um, what we have on sort of public display. So the idea that somehow by removing some of them, we're not getting the complete historical picture looks very kind of a bit, yeah. of, a bit of a hollow <laughs> argument. We've already got this very kind of sanitised, carefully selected, very racially biased, gender biased sort of mm. um, selection of what counts as our important history. So I'm not really persuaded by those sorts of arguments. Um, and also, I think there's, there's, there's sort of worrying patterns about what people are willing to overlook. I mean, nobody complained when we sort of took down the statues of Jimmy Savile. Um, <laughs> so I think there's a kind of... No one said, look, you know, sure, he was a paedophile, but he did really good charity work, right? <laughs> so the thought that we, you can surely distinguish the good works from the moral wrongdoing just doesn't look very persuasive in those cases. Um, and it worries me that the cases in which we tend to be willing to overlook it tend to be things like cases involved in racism, slavery, um, where you've still got groups which are still kind of very much kind of um, suffering the, the his, historical legacy of those practices. And that we would still have statues of, I think... In some cases, it could be um, that we ought to remove them, some cases not, depending on what the society is like at the time. But I think in a situation where, say, um, people still suffer kind of ongoing injustice as a result of sort of legacy of slavery, I think there could be a case for removing the statues, yeah. And I'd also like to come back to this question of, of restoration or not. Um, and there is, a, there is a, a happy medium, perhaps, which is stabilisation, so we all know, all, all of us who live in the UK are familiar with the ruins of the, the monasteries that were um, dismantled under the Tudors. Mm. And those, those ruins are part of our landscape and become mm. a very... So they're, they're, the romance of the ruin mm. is a very important part of the, sort of the British um, mm. aesthetic. I also I was an undergraduate um, at Warwick University and lived for a while uh, close to the ruins of Coventry Cathedral, which had been bombed in the, the Second World War, and the choice was made then to stabilise those ruins and build a new cathedral next to it. And so I think those sorts of places where it's not a question of weighing up are people living here, how do we rehouse them, but memorialising the death mm-hmm. and the destruction and the loss of people's lives and the loss of heritage by allowing those ruins to become part of the fabric of the city or of, of, the, um, of the countryside, I think is also a, a very important way to, to negotiate and resolve those, those apparent tensions. Thank you. Yes, Sam. Um, I have actually... Um, I know quite a lot of architects currently in Syria are working on this idea of... Um, rebuilding, reconstructing. But of course, sometimes the tools are far Mm. too modest. And actually, an outside help, it's really very, very much appreciated. But the problem sometimes, the outside help comes with a tag. And this is what I feel that um, it's, if there is somebody has no agenda and happy to go and help and respect the local knowledge, the local touch, the local flavor, without embedding their own agenda, I will definitely go for that. But I know that is, it's not an easy thing to do. It is always, I know, for example, that uh, many, uh, um, many cultures had interfered with, and it is, it's now the redoing of, of, the, of the deconstruction, if you like, not reconstruction, but deconstruction. Um, I just wanted to leave you with this image. Um, again, um, I, as an artist, I feel it quite, uh, quite very powerful. Um, there was a very beautiful piece in the Turbine Hall a few years ago by the crack on the, in, the, in the Turbine Hall in the Tate Modern. And I found that crack has so much weight to it. But again, when it was buried is equally as powerful. So I feel that is having the artist actually being responsible or taking the decision. I am actually... They could have reconstructed it in a way that is invisible. But having it visible, having the history of it being part of its, his, it, its if you like, image or its presence, um, I found that is quite... A, just as an example, that is... We don't want to, but I know exactly what you are talking about, knowing the VNA that is, I have passed nearby that one. And it's, of course, many architects actually thinking about they need to cast many walls with the bullets that is, was mentioned, that is, with the bullets, to rebuild the city, but with these bullets as part of them. They are not 
the latest engineering facades, but actually with these bullets as part of them. Well, thank you very much for all your fantastic questions, and thank you to the panel for the discussion. Like Issam's puzzle, it's taken us back through time. It's <laughs> been many-layered and sometimes surprising. So thank you very much indeed. Good night.